Okay, finally, let's hear um, about return to Nanga Jela. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Emil Meja. I am the project manager for the team of Pemulaik and Nanga Jela, or Return to Nanga Jela. Uh, yeah. So before we get started, I think it's important that we uh, thank and, you know, honestly honor, offer a round of applause to a group of people without whom this project would have been impossible. Stuart Gaffin, Christine Paddock, Bobby Niagang, Itin Langit, Radley Horton, Lindsay Horn, Carrie Shimkus, the whole department would be impossible without Carrie. Uh, Ethan Mitchell, Austin Paris, and Judy Jamal. So very quickly, just <laughs> the absolute heroes of this project when we're not being the heroes of this project. So, <laughs> all right, on that note. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brad Parker, and I'm the team lead for the Research, Archives, and Data Outre Outreach team. But uh, before I talk about that, I'm here to talk about uh, our client. Our client is Return to Nangajala, or in the Iban language, Pemalai Kanangajala. This project, focused on restoring the memories and community of an Iban longhouse, is headed by Dr. Christine Paddock and her Iban colleagues, with whom she has had a 40-year relationship. Dr. Paddock is a Columbia-trained PhD and an ecological anthropologist, and her work focuses mainly on indigenous land and forest management. A little background to the project. Uh, this project rose out of a desire to rebuild the scattered community of Nangajala, an indigenous Iban group. Uh, their traditional longhouse home, environmental surroundings, and agricultural lands were flooded in pursuit of the government-implemented Batong Ai hydropower project during the 1980s. The hydropower plant still stands, but the scattering of the people of Nangajala and the passing of time has loosened the once tightly knit community. In recent years, however, the people of Nangajala have, become, have begun reclaiming and consolidating historical and cultural knowledge of their unique history with the help of uh, Dr. Christine Paddock. The goal of our project is to aid the Nangajala community in the process of reconstructing and preserving their history for future generations. Now, that's a very complex issue to try and address. And we were given, uh, you know, we're very thankful to our client for giving us a wide breadth of operation. Uh, we were really given just a set of desired deliverables, a set of overarching goals, and then we were allowed to really roam free and do what we could to really see how we could help bring this community together and bring remembrance to their culture. So to do that, we split off into five teams. Web design, mapping and modeling, RADO, or Research Archives and Data Outreach. As you can see, that's a bit of a mouthful, so we went for RADO. Uh, the genealogy tool and the diaspora project. In five teams, we prepared what is now Nangajala.com. So, you know, we do have this very pretty PowerPoint, but if y'all could take your phones out, you could also go to Nangajala.com, and we'll run through it together. To introduce it, here's Ambria, the head of the web design team. Thank you. Absolute madness, looking at it, everyone looking down at their phones. <laughs> um, so uh, welcome to our website. This is the culmination of not only the web design team, but the concerted efforts of all other four teams. So uh, keep that in mind when you look at it. We didn't do all this work. Um, but the first page is essentially kind of an opening page for those members of the you know, global community who don't necessarily know what, who you know, the Iban are or what Nagajala is. Um, so. If you scroll a little bit further down, you can see just a quick background on the project, uh, why it occurred, you know, what we're doing with it, and what we hope to achieve with it. Further down, we have a brief history. Um, Brad has given us a absolutely delightful history, but if you'd like to read more, uh, this is a blurb that was prepared uh, with Dr. Paddock. And as we enter the site, uh, we see a menu page with all of the sites that you know, correspond to each of the group projects. Uh, there is not one for web design because our project was the entire site. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Annie for maps. Hi, my name is Annie, and I was the project leader for the maps and modeling section. We have a nice little tab here on the website. Uh, you want to click on that. Uh, so basically, the goal of the maps was to allow the community to connect with their topographic area and some of the landscapes surrounding their home um, through a series of four maps. 
So the first map we have here is a map of the past before the dam was installed. Uh, and you can see within the map the different areas and features within their region that are highlighted. The second map shows the current um, area of uh, Nangal Jala and kind of the corresponding photos related to each of these little dots that you can see. The third and probably my favorite is the map that Wong created, kind of showing this progression from the past um, to the present. In red, we have the longhouse, and now it is submerged underwater. So, yeah. This map here is part of the Diaspora project um, that one of our team leads um, helped run. Um, but this was basically designed to help show the diasporic nature of um, the community and where they fled to. So if you kind of zoom around on this map, you can click on the different features. And if I can click on it, it'll say kind of who's living where, which is really cool. Thank you. All right, I'm going to head back. I'm Brad again. Hello. Very nice to see you all. So go ahead and head back to the menu. And I'm just going to take you through the photo archive. So to address this project's need for a huge amount of data and material concerning Nangajala, uh, RADA, or Research Archives and Data Outreach, mainly concerned itself with uh, these main tasks. Identifying and tracking potential sources of data, reaching out to these potential sources, collecting, archiving, and tracking all the data that we get, and then lastly, and probably most importantly, is facilitating the handoff of all these materials to Christine and her colleagues. Uh, to achieve these goals, uh, we created a, an archival system within Google Drive, um, and this includes an outreach tracker to track past and potential future sources of data, the archive itself, and an archive handbook used to organize the archive. Uh, and if you scroll through and click on specifics, you'll be able to see beautiful pictures of the longhouse before it was submerged, and then you can click through the other sections to see more. Um, there are more pictures, and they are all housed in the Google Drive, but uh, you, will need, uh, you will need permission from Nangajala, Return to Nangajala, to see them. Hello, I'm Rashad, and I was uh, heading up the genealogy tool team, and I'm going to explain a little bit about the genealogy tool to you right now. So when this community got displaced, a lot of, a lot of people lost track of their, not just their immediate family, but extended family as well, cousins, aunts, uncles, and so the genealogy tool team, we were tasked with taking Dr. Paddock's 1973 census from her time there and taking that census and putting it into a database so those people that were around in 1973 or their descendants can actually go and search their ancestors or themselves and find out, you know, who am I related to? Who is this person? Who is that? Oh, and Because they're all separated, they're all sc scattered now, and now they can find out, oh, wait, that's, that's my, my second uncle or my, my third cousin. And so we have a whole database of people, and we're expecting about 25,000 descendants from the original people in the census from 1973 to join when the, when the whole thing gets launched in June. Uh, but our team, we entered about 749 individuals into this database, and we just cannot wait for more to come. But unfortunately, you guys can't see past this login page because that would be a terrible invasion of their privacy. Um, but I've seen past it, and trust me, it's good. It's really good. <laughs> So another section of our website is the selfie project that's related to map four that I showed you. Uh, we had a lot of people not only given their coordinates and their name and their family and location, but lovely photos of themselves. Um, so these are a few uh, pictures of some of the people in the Nangajala community and their corresponding coordinates like I showed you in map four. So we also had some limitations and challenges during this project that I think are worth sharing with you. So the first is communication or lack thereof. We were obviously trying to communicate and be involved with people that are millions of miles away on the other side of the world. Um, we are current students at Columbia in New York City, and trying to create a project with a community that we haven't even interacted with was definitely a challenge. There's also a language barrier and time change challenge, um, which came in the way, but through you know checking our emails late at night and talking with um, Dr. Paddock, we were able to definitely overcome this challenge. We also had very little uh, pre-existing knowledge within this subject, but we had a very extensive literature review in the beginning of our um, project here to read up about the culture of um, Iban, of Nangajala, to understand the language a bit better, 
the culture, the environment. Um, so yeah, those were some of the challenges we faced. So after what I'm sure were initial you know, expressions of awe and surprise, um, many of you might be wondering how exactly this connects to sustainable development. Um, and you know, one of the most important things about sustainability and about the, you know, the current environmental movement is that it's not just a change in you know, a mindset or a change in habits. It's a sustained cultural change. Uh, what we're trying to produce is a global sustained cultural change. And so you know, it's very important for us to maintain a connection with nature, as my, many of the Nangajala um, communities, particularly our Nangajala Longhouse had. So a personal connection with nature and a personal connection with a culture that was so entrenched within a very specific community and environment is really important to maintain this culture of, and connection, connection with nature as this diaspora you know, spreads out and becomes more fractured. This is also the preservation of traditional and cultural heritage and knowledge. So many of these agriculture practices, many of the you know, uh, traditional foods and celebration, um, that's all kind of part of the culture of sustainability that embodied money of you know, the Iban people. So finally, we also wanted to emphasize that we utilize what modern technology and often modern sustainability methods use modern technology to you know, create more environmentally friendly policies or to create more environmentally friendly habits. So what we did was, did was we combined this modern technology with a sustained connection to heritage, right, to a very old um, you know, archive of knowledge and, um, and tradition. And so together we, sh we think this is a successful model for other communities that might have been displaced or you know, traditionally neglected by uh, maybe colonial or imperialist powers. Um, so this can serve as another, another tool for communities to use that can mesh traditional and really community-rooted knowledge with modern technology. Yeah, so in conclusion, I think it's important that we take into account the history of this place. This place that, again, none of us has ever been to or seen in person. But this place where really hydropower is a form of green energy, was an early driver of green energy. But we have to consider the ramifications of what we do. Sustainability is multifaceted, and we have been privileged to be able to use some of our education in the Sustainable Development Department to help fix what really partially in the name of sustainability was done to this community. So, on that incredibly somber note, the, this is our lovely, amazing team that I couldn't be prouder of. If they would come up here uh, to receive questions, that is what we have to say, and we're happy to answer any further questions on the subject. Great job, guys! Uh, really impressive website. Um, I'm just looking at you know some of the photos of the. Um, I'm imagining these folks, um, you know, in the middle of the jungle. And I know I saw some more modern pictures when you saw the the selfie project. Um, but I'm just curious about the access um, and how, like, what the plans are for uh, some of the perhaps older generations to access, um, you know, the genealogy trees and like, is there Wi-Fi out there? Like, <laughs> you know, any any insight into that that you come across? I'd be interested to hear. Uh, Amri, you well, uh, nonetheless, no. no but <laughs> one of the one of the early guidelines that our client did lay out for us is the fact that, uh, as is very common in, in, in this region and many developing regions of the world, people mainly access the internet through their phones. So, which is why y'all got that nice little wipe when you opened the site. We really worked to make it ma very compatible through the, through the mobile experience because that is generally how most, it's most commonly accessed. So people have cellular plans that allow them to go on the internet. And I think this does also address like, a common, you know, perhaps misperception that um, some of these people don't have like, full access to technology and aren't well versed in technology. Um, so a lot of them have relocated uh, or, you know, moved and are working in separate places around the globe, as you can see from our beautiful selfie diaspora map. And so oh, many of them do have access to that technology. It might just be issues such as low bandwidth internet, uh, which we try to address in our mobile adaptation of the website. I also want to add that we created an entire manual for steps moving forward to help people in this community edit the website, make changes within the maps, 
So we have a pretty extensive outline on how to do that in our manual in addition to the website. And on the topic of the genealogy tool, it's not really that size intense. It's, um, well, I think fit a little over 50 kilobytes in its current state, so I, I think it's pretty easy to pick it up on the phone. Um, heard some of you heard some of you talking, maybe grappling a little bit with the issue of the extent to which you all should try to sort of define the experience, sort of create a broader context of your own for the project, um, versus really kind of sticking to just the deliverables, sort of, I guess, partly on the assumption that these are people with a very different worldview and experience. Is that if anyone wants to talk a little bit about, about sort of that, that dynamic um, and sort of how you addressed, how you addressed that? <laughs> yes, so um, at the beginning, when Dr. Paddock approached us, we didn't know exactly what we were getting into. And that's more in the sense that we didn't know that these were going to be our deliverables. But beyond that, well, what our role was. And what I mean by role is we are here in New York. Most of us have maybe never been to Asia, not even close to Malaysia and to the island of Borneo. So, like, what, what's up with that? Like, are we... <laughs> Like, is that ethical? And uh, to, to answer your question, um, maybe not. Maybe that's not ethical. Like, why should it be us, the ones, let's say, processing all this information, cataloging it, classifying it? Uh, because that, to some extent, is already judging all of this information, all of this um, basically unbiased sources that we are making biased. So that was part of our discussion at the beginning because of course, we have a very good education, thankfully, and we have access to a lot of tools that beyond allowing us to decipher whether or not something is good, whether or not something should be classified as X, Y, or Z, they allow us to create tools so that others, people who can actually judge and reflect on this culture, do it. Um, so in the end, our project was not to provide a a set of deliverables. A, our project was to provide a set of tools that then this community down the line can help, uh, can use to recreate their history because as Dr. Paddock uh, explained many, many times as it, as, and as it's been mentioned in her dissertation, which I had to, to read, um, <laughs> these people have culturally uh, this idea that, well, backtracking on that, culture is bound by memory. Without memory, without ways of reconnecting with our past, we don't have culture. And in our culture, that's normally done through images, through paintings, through written information. But in their case, where's the, mem where's the memory? Is it in written information? No. Is it in images? We do have these images, but they're from, let's say, Dr. Paddock or people who went there, Westerners. So where's their memory? And their memory is, in fact, in the land. And that's why we, uh, we place a lot of emphasis on recovering the memory that was in the land. And Dr. Paddock may, may explain like hours on this, but the land, the physical features of, of all these places are what keeps their memory. So without us being able to recover that memory in some way, shape, or form, they're, they're a community, but they're no longer a community. They're, they don't have any ways of, of reaching the past that it's no longer there. So a related question, um, and so, as someone who has, in fact, been in these areas, um, the main cultural distinction in, in most of it is not really Western versus Borneo or Iban culture. It's Iban culture against greater Malay culture or Indonesian culture. Um, the res resettlement programs from the cities of Malaysia into Borneo are the things that are affecting the culture in many ways more. Did you find any of those issues came up in your, in your efforts or as opposed to the efforts of an anthropologist who comes in with a very different perspective than, than most of the resettlement programs and efforts locally and domestically within Malaysia? Of course, um, so a lot of this project um, I hesitate to use the word tiptoe, but there is a, a, um, a delicate political situation uh, in Malaysia between all of these different ethnic groups. And we were urged to shy away from directly commenting on the political situation um, as it's not our place to interfere. 
um, we, we, um, we may have an opinion on the matter, but it does not, um, it should not affect the people that we are trying to help. And so the, the real point of this is, is to, to take as unbiased a look at the situation and hand over the tools uh, that we can create to the people who have the capacity and have really the right to, to make these sort of uh, calls. Um, so I know that's a little unsatisfying, but um, I think it was important for us to be um, as hands-off as we could when it came to um, judgment, uh, uh, when, it came, when it comes to sort of political institutions and, and, and structures of power uh, in the area. We, we also that? say that because, uh, as Dr. Paddock cautioned us, this is an ongoing problem. Mm -hmm. So any kind of interference could end up affecting that, not us. So in the end, like it's, we try to shy away from that and be there as, as someone who's providing tools, but not someone who's using them. We also wanted to make these tools um, more widely applicable to other you know, communities that might be in different situations of power or different um, relationships with a governmental you know, figure or authority. Um, and so providing these like really basic, and I hesitate to say you know, unbiased, but these very basic tools that can be used to many ends um, was one of our priorities. Is there any concern? I mean, the act of organizing and remembering itself is something that may violate the, the balance that you're trying to establish there. I'm sure you have those discussions. Oh, we got real metaphysical, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we debated, like no proper, like for example. Sure. Yeah, it's great. Uh, hello. So as you you know, as as you heard with scorn in their voices, I recommended that we do a literature review at the start and get a little bit, you know, because does a sort of debate where we at least wanted to know what was up and what was down, because ultimately, we're not. I mean. Most of us are Americans, I think. Half of us, questionable. We're a bit of a diaspora in ourselves. But the, the, the group, we could, we, we don't know enough really to say. I still to this day think very, we very well might. There are people in the community who who might end up seeing this, and uh, we appreciate again the the guidance of Dr. Paddock and through all of this. But we might be wrong. You know, it's a harsh statement for Columbia's halls. But it, it, it's, it, uh, yeah, we try to restrict our roles to that of really. As much as we could, just uh, not even, I wouldn't even go as far as to say anthropology or history or anything as bold or erudite as that. It's just really just cataloging. The word tool has been used about 18 times. We really just try to serve as faceless <laughs> and not corporate, but you know, the, as much of just the product, the assistance that we could, you know. Uh, yeah. Our role was to be a liaison between, yeah. you know, the submerged land and the scattered community, and the scattered diaspora. And well, there, you know, is inherent epistemological bias there. You know, it, we we endeavored to ma minimize it as much as possible. You know, obviously there are going to be structural issues. The issue of memory period could be seen as a you know a resistant act, but um, because it was important to the community, and you know, this ultimately arose from Dr. Paddock's interactions with community members who expressed an interest in you know. Re renewing their history and renewing their communities and saying, you know, where is my family? I haven't seen, you know, this person that I know was part of my genealogy since 1973. And so we ultimately responded to a wish from within the community to engage this um, historical, you know, engage this historical culture once more. And while, you know, in and of itself, it might be a challenge to certain power structures and we might have inherent bias, you know, uh, because of where we live and how we, you know, grew up and how we approach this information, but we really endeavored to do the best we could to provide, to be a liaison um, instead of kind of this authoritative force. <laughs> I, can shout. I, I just wanted to say, and Amber just uh, um, touched on this, Everything was passed by, a, by passed to a committee. If you saw that list of people that they thanked at the beginning, there were people with names like Bobby Nyagang and Iten Langet and all. These are people who are sort of leaders in this community. There is an advisory group. There are several advisory groups, which held up a lot of their work at various times <laughs> as we waited for people to respond and say. This is what we want. We want these pictures. We want this. This all started. Oh, yeah, I mean, this all started with them. I was, I was pushed into doing this. And, 
And um, so, so it, it's, I appreciate all of your questions, but these, I think the team actually was very cautious in this and they did get um, input and permission at, at multiple, multiple steps from the advisory group and uh, from the, essentially the coordinators of the project who were, most of whom were Iban, not me. Okay, so uh, we finished a little early. There's time for folks to stick around, have some snacks and uh, coffee and such in the back. Um, but let's let's take this moment to again sort of collectively thank the three teams for their great work and all the people who supported the projects. Too. <laughs>